Welcome to Global Evangelistic Center here in Kissimmee, Florida. Please be seated. In your Bible, from last week, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Marvelous light. My message title this morning is continuing on, A Priesthood Out of Darkness. But the specific focus this morning is into the marvelous light of Melchizedek. Into the marvelous light of Melchizedek. In my last message, we started to talk about the royal priesthood, which we have been called to by first looking at the darkness that we have been called out of, by looking at the necessity of the nature change before we can walk into that office. We looked at the testimony of Jacob. Uh, whose name means grabber and deceiver, uh, to, 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 to how the pre-incarnate Christ impacted his life at the Ford Jabuk. Jacob, through whom God had promised would come not only a great nation, but a whole company of nations, Jacob could not receive the promises of Abba his heavenly father, until he had a, a name, a character, a nature change. Amen? Yes, now, uh, First Peter, Sister Ormi, get ready to read for me. First Peter chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. Uh, this royal priesthood that we are called to become, <laughs> that we're called to become, royal priest, is also... Uh, it calls for us to have a changed nature. Because you see, we got some people that are out in the front lines. And uh, when the wild man is loose, the call is a noose. <laughs> they ain't changed. And uh, they're making a mess of things. This royal priesthood that we are called to become is also, it also calls for us to have a changed nature nature as the darkness that we are meant to be delivered from is clearly laid out at the beginning of first peter chapter 2 uh, verses 1 to 5 hit it for me sister Ormi. i'm reading from the new king james version therefore laying aside all malice all deceit hypocrisy envy and all evil speaking as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow Thereby, if indeed you have tasted, the Lord mm. is gracious. Coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priest to offer up spiritual sacrifices accepted to God through Jesus Christ. So we're supposed to be a royal priesthood and a holy priesthood. Amen. Now, to best understand our call to being this royal priesthood that has been called to offer up spiritual sacrifices, we must look at the Judaic foundation of the priesthood itself. For this, we turn to the Levitical priesthood, the first Cohen, Jewish priest. The founder of the priestly clan was Aaron, brother of Moses of the tribe of Levi. All of Israel are descended from the 12 sons of Jacob. Jacob's third son was Levi, and Aaron was a fourth generation descendant of Levi. Get ready to read for me. Sister Joyce, Exodus chapter 28, verses 1 to 3. I know you have it in the Jewish uh, interpretation, probably Tree of Life or Complete Jewish Bible. Aaron and his four sons were designated as the first priest. 
Aaron served as the first high priest, and all of his male descendants were chosen by God to be priests forever. It is an eternal covenant. Thus, even today, a Cohen among the Jewish people is genealogically a direct descendant of Aaron. Amen? Exodus chapter 28, verses 1 to 3. Bring your brother Aaron, Aaron's sons from among B'nai Israel, that's the people of Israel, so that they may minister to me as Kohanim, hmm. priests. Aaron and his sons Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar and Ithamar, you are to make holy garments for your brother Aaron for splendor and for beauty. You are to speak to all who are skilled, whom I have filled with a spirit of artistry, to make Aaron's garments for consecrating him so that he may minister to me as a Kohen. Amen. You see, you can be a Levite, but you don't have to be a priest. <laughs> but you cannot be a priest unless you are a Levite. Oh, I, I, I think there's a word here for, for someone here under the sound of my voice or wherever my voice carries over the world that may have been born into a good family of God-fearing people, but they might be running from the calling on their lives and even disgusted by how they have seen what the ministry has done to their beloved family member. You see, some families, they have a generational blessing and they have gifts that seem to be common to that family. And while we celebrate, uh, you know, the blessing on them, there are some people out there that are hurt by what they have seen with regards to the toll that the ministry has taken on their family. But if God has called you, then you may end up in the belly of a whale like Jonah before you, <laughs> before you yield to God and answer the generational call of God on your life. I don't care how fast you run, you can't outrun God. Amen? Uh, so now you, you, you can be a Levite, but you don't have to be a priest. But you cannot be a priest unless you are a Levite. Because the Jewish Kohanim, priesthood and priests, are traditionally required to be of direct patrilineal descent. In other words, it got to come from daddy. But under the order of Melchizedek, this law of patrilineal descent has been nullified because this is the order under which the priesthood of Christ has been established. Sister Kelly, get ready to read for me Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 to 4. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 to 4. You see, we are a royal priesthood according to the royal kingship and priesthood of Yeshua HaMasiah of Jesus. And this priesthood was not after the Levitical or the Aaronic order of priest because if he was, he could not redeem us from the curse of the law. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 to 4. Hebrews 8, 1 to 4. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. 
for every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore, it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. Hmm. For if... For if we were on earth, hmm. he should not be a priest, <laughs> seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Dad's get ready to read for me Hebrews chapter 2, verses 17 to 18. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 17 to 18. Now, Christ's priesthood was not after the Levitical or Aaronic order. <laughs> Got to say that again, because if it were, he would not be able to empower us who are in him to overcome the temptation of sin. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 17 to 18. Wherefore, in all things it beloved him, it behooved, it behooved him to be made like mm. unto his brethren, <laughs> that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest yes. in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he <laughs> himself has suffered being tempted, hmm. he is able to succor them that are tempted. <laughs> so you see the, the, the power of God's word and the power of this great high priest who has passed through the heaven, who has been where we have been, who has been tempted like we have been tempted, but without sin. Amen. Amen. Christ was made a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, according to Hebrews chapter 5, verse 6. Papa Vanga Sammy, get ready to read for me Hebrews chapter 5, verses 4 to 6. And even though this is a high priest and a high priestly office with better promises and, and, and better benefits, even though this is the current priesthood that pertains to us, it is one that is very little understood. Most people don't understand the power of the Melchizedek priesthood. The priesthood was and is a calling from God, but a calling that necessitated patrilineal laws to be observed. But under Melchizedek, you are a priest, and I am a priest, and we are all priests. Amen, amen. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 4 to 6. No one takes this honor upon himself. Hmm. He must be called by God, just as Aaron was. So Christ also did not take upon himself the glory of becoming a high priest. <laughs> but God said to him, You are my son. Today I have become your father. <laughs> and he says in another, another place, You are a priest forever in the order of of Melchizedek. <laughs> I like how the complete Jewish Bible puts it. Sister Joyce, hit that in the Jewish uh, version. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when he is called by God as Aaron was. So also Messiah did not glorify himself to be made Cohen Gadol, yes. that's high priest. Mm -hmm. Rather, it was God who said to him, you are my son. Today I have become your father. And he says in a different passage, you are a Cohen forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. <laughs> Amen. There are some in the hierarchy of the present day body of Christ that incorrectly state that the tithe was done away <laughs> with in the old covenant. But the Old Testament, when we look at that, how could this be when this was a priesthood after which the order of Melchizedek, Jesus' priesthood was established on? Hebrews chapter 7, verses 1 to 12. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter 
of the kings and blessed him to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all first being an interpretation king of righteousness and after that also king of Salem which is king of peace the Melchizedek order of Christ priesthood denotes a superiority to that of the Levitical and the Aaronic priesthood because of the characteristic feature of its undated past. In other words, no point of reference in a beginning. Abraham was special to the Jews. Amen? He was a patriarch, literally the first father. Abraham was the father of the Jewish nation, but Abraham was blessed by Melchizedek and responded to that blessing by giving to him a tithe of all of his spoils. Hallelujah. All right. <laughs> Before. Yes, Rabbi. This is significant. It is significant because of the underlying principle of blessing the principle is that the lesser is blessed by the greater so the foundation of the royal priesthood that we have been called to has as its foundational base Melchizedek who Abraham tithed to <laughs> you see when we understand these things it will give us a different revelation when we question exactly who Melchizedek is. <laughs> and the tithe after the victory in battle that Abraham paid. But we're we going to come back to that. What I want to focus on for the remainder of this message is the charge to show forth the praises of him who hath called us out of darkness into his marvelous, marvelous light. <laughs> you see, uh, call me a cook, but to me, every word in the word of God is eternally impregnated with revelation and truth. Yeah. Every word. Yeah. Yes. Amen. You just got to understand exactly. Go past them translations and go to your Hebrew. Yeah. Or go to your Greek for the New Testament. Marvelous. Pala. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the Hebrew. Pala. How's that, Rabbi? <laughs> Thank you much. <laughs> Pala. It, 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 it's defined as, as separate by distinguishing action. To be beyond one's power. In other words, you can't do it in the natural. You got to take it to the spiritual. Amen. To be difficult to do. To be difficult to understand. To do extraordinary or hard or difficult things. To make wonderful. To do wondrously. To show oneself wonderful or marvelous. Marvelous. <laughs> yes. I looked at that word and God gave me a revelation of understanding the priesthood that we are called to. The marvelous light. The stone which the builders refused is become the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. You see, when the ark of God's covenant with Israel, which was the symbol of God's Conditional covenant with Israel. 
to do good to them and their children, to bless them and their generations if they obeyed him and his laws. When the ark of God's covenant, which was meant to be housed in the inner sanctum of the tabernacle in the desert and eventually in the temple when it was to be built in Jerusalem, when the ark returned, when the ark of God's covenant returned to that blessed city of King David, after being taken back from the Philistines, it marked a season of where the glory had departed from Israel, as expressed through the naming of the old priest Eli's grandchild, Ichabod. This was such a horrifically shocking reality that Eli dropped dead at just receiving the news of this. But when the Ark of God's covenant was recaptured, I need to read it again, ready to read for me. Psalm 105 verses 1 to 7. Psalm 105 verses 1 to 7. When the Ark of God's covenant was recaptured, and returned to Israel and burnt sacrifices and peace offerings made before God. After King David had appointed certain of the Levites to minister before the ark of the Lord and to record and to thank and praise the Lord God of Israel, the praise that was declared revealed the marvelous light that reveals the marvelous work of a marvelous God that has called a holy people to walk in that marvelously holy light. On that day, David had delivered first this psalm to thank the Lord into the hand of Asaph, who was one of the worship leaders in the tabernacle choir. And Asaph's brethren, Psalm 105 verses 1 to 7. Praise Adonai, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him, tell about all his wonders, glory in his holy name. Let the heart of those who seek Adonai rejoice. Hmm. Seek Adonai and his strength, seek his face always. Remember his wonders that he has done, his miracles and the judgments of his mouth. O seed of Abraham, his servant, O children of Jacob, his chosen ones. He is Adonai, our God. His judgments are in all the earth. I uh, couldn't think of a better person to read that. Thank you, Rabbi. Verse 5 says, remember his marvelous works that he has done. The praise that was declared revealed the marvelous light that reveals the marvelous work have a marvelous God. Marvelous works that are meant to always be remembered. You see, sometimes we get in a bind and sometimes we feel like God is not there. But all we have to do is think back and know that we serve a marvelous God that does marvelous things and he does it in a marvelous way. Marvelous works that are meant to always be remembered. When we are going through a time like Israel. When it may feel like God's presence has left us alone. But a time where we are called to remember. How marvelous his workings were. As we seek his strength to deliver us. In times of trials and in times of tribulations to deliver us so that we can be strengthened once again by the marvelous workings of a marvelous God that seeks a people that will live holy and be governed by his righteous judgments. That was what the ark of his covenant symbolized that if they obeyed him and his laws that they will and would have been blessed yes. hmm. that 
has called a holy people to walk in that marvelously holy light. You got to live holy. The ark of God's holy covenant was a wooden chest clad with gold containing where according to Hebrews chapter 9 verses 3 to 4 we learn that uh, this ark contained the gold jar of manna. Manna being symbolic of God's divine provision which is a word of encouragement for people that may have to walk through the wilderness and where they have no option but to depend upon God to put food on their table. I, I, I don't know, some people, they were just born blessed. And then some people, they got to go through the wilderness where the only hope that they have is to believe in the supernatural power of God to put food on their table so that they can feed themselves and feed their children. God is a marvelous God. The ark had Aaron's staff that had budded, which is a message of godly leadership and authority and about the sovereignty of God's will to choose whoever he wants to choose to lead his people. And this ain't no choice that is subject to the dictates of men and power brokers because power brokers and men they'll lift you up and then when you say what thus saith the Lord if it hits them they'll drag you down yes. but when God puts you up yes. nobody can touch you because he whom God keeps is well kept yes. the third thing that we see the are contained was the stone tablets of the covenant reminding us of the necessity of God's word in our lives. The steps of a righteous man are hoarded by the Lord. God will tell you where to walk. God will tell you how to walk. God will tell you when to walk. And when you go with God, hmm, Father, don't leave me. When you go with God, you will walk at the right time. You will walk into the right place. And you will walk right into your blessing. Oh, if thy presence go not with me, carry me not up hence. I don't need no man to put me up. God is my deliverer. God is my promoter. God is my enlarger of my territory. You see, as powerful as the message is about what the ark contained, the real Judeo-Christian marvelous message in the ark of the covenant involves the lid of the box, which is known as the mercy seat. <laughs> now, 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 the, the, the term mercy seat comes from a Hebrew word meaning to cover, to placate, to appease, to cleanse, to cancel or make atonement for. It was here that the high priest, only once a year, entered the Holy of Holies, where the ark was kept and atoned for his sins and the sins of the Israelites. But, 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 but here we are back in, in time uh, to the day when the ark had been returned to the Hebrew people after being taken away from the Philistines. It was a day of praising. Oh, you know you will be happy when God's presence comes in. It was a day of praising and a day of dancing and of sacrificing before the Lord and a day where amidst all of those festivities that he did something that should never be forgotten by a royal priesthood uh, that has been called to continue a kingdom mandate 
before God in our present age. I need to read it to get ready. Mama V, Psalm 105, verses 8 to 15. Psalm 105, verses 8 to 15. The praise that was declared on that day revealed the marvelous light that reveals the marvelous works of a marvelous God that has called a holy people to walk into that marvelously holy light. What King David had to say on that day was directly taken from Psalm 105. We have read the first section of it from verse 1 to verse 7. Let's pick up now and continue his quote from verse 8 to verse 15. Psalm 105, verses 8 to 15. Mama, hit it. He remembers his covenant forever, the word which he commanded for a thousand generations, the covenant which he made with Abraham and his oath to Isaac, and confirmed it to Jacob for a statute, to Israel as an everlasting covenant, saying, To you I will give the land of Canaan hmm. as the atonement of your inheritance. Hmm. And when they were few in number, indeed very few, and strangers in it, when they went from one nation to another, from one kingdom to another people, he permitted no one to do them wrong. Uh, come on. Yes, he rebuked kings for their sake, saying, Do not touch my anointed ones, and do my prophets no harm. Yeah, 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 you see, first of all, I don't care what the United Nations says, that land belongs to the Hebrew people. Thus saith the Lord. I don't care what declaration or what accord is passed, I go with God. That land is a holy land that belongs to a holy people. And we, the engrafted church, we have the promises of God that God will watch over us. And that when they rise up against us, touch not the Lord's anointed. And do thy prophets no harm. You see, when you come up against us as a holy priesthood that stands in the office of God, ambassadors, when they come up against us, they come up against God. I've been in enough battles to, to know that he is fearsome in battle. He is awesome in praise. Touch not the Lord's anointed. <laughs> and do thy prophet no harm. First Chronicles chapter 16 verses 11 to 12. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face continually. Remember his marvelous works that he hath done. His wonders and the judgments of his mouth we must never forget God's marvelous works this is a mandate for all of his holy and covenant people now our exegetical points here with regards to understanding the, 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 the marvelous dimension of the light that our present day royal priesthood has been called to uh, as we sap this wisdom from our Judaic foundation from the tree that we have been grafted into is what we are a royal priesthood that has been charged with ensuring that the glory of God's presence never departs from a holy nation if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, we are a priesthood that have been dispatched all over the world. But starting with Israel, we, the engrafted, have been stationed globally. 
We've been stationed all over the world, from Trinidad to Guyana to the Bahamas, and the enemy is moving to Jamaica, to Lithuania, to Denmark, all over the world. The royal priesthood is dispatched, <laughs> starting with Israel. But we, the engrafted, we have been stationed globally. So I will say, the nation of our assignment that we're in, the only way to stop our nations from reaching an Ichabod state is by never forgetting just what it is in the ark of God's covenant, the gold jar of manna. God will provide for his people. Aaron's staff that had budded. God's leadership and direction. You can't go wrong. The stone tablets of the covenant. God's word must be upheld in our nations. And God keeps covenant forever. That's the second point. Sister Kira, get ready to read for me. Psalm 17 verses 6 to 9. God keeps covenant forever with us. And you know the reverse is also true with regards to the generational sins of our people that fall down the generational lines but can be broken. The real Judeo-Christian marvelous message in the Ark of the Covenant involves the lid of the box which is known as the mercy seat. It is at the mercy seat where sins are forgiven and where curses are broken. Yes, Psalm 17, 6 to 9. I have called upon you, O God, you will, for you will hear me. Incline your ear to me and hear my speech. Show your marvelous loving kindness, O you who save by your right hand those who trust and take refuge in you from those who rise up against them. Keep and guard me as the pupil of your eye. Mm. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. Mm. From the wicked who despoil and oppress me, my deadly adversaries who surround me. Anytime you hear the right hand of God, that is speaking about Yeshua HaMasiah yeah. because he is seated at the right hand of God yeah. making intercession for us. Amen. You know, I believe that this wasn't just a position that he uh, suddenly attained. I believe when he got up to walk into humanity, he left that position Amen. of being seated Amen. at the right hand of God. Yes. So when we hear the right hand of God, that's none other than our victorious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Yes. The King of Righteousness. Uh, the third thing is the covenant of God must be the foundation for the law of our nation. Anything else will cause God's glory to leave us in an Ichabod, desolate state. You see, it, it, it makes no difference how great we may have once been. Just as he warned the Hebrew people, people he speaks to all nations today through psalm 105 starting at verse 8 he hath remembered his covenant forever the word which he commanded to a thousand generations which covenant he made with abraham and his oath unto isaac and confirmed the same unto jacob for a law and to Israel for an everlasting covenant saying unto thee will I give the land of Canaan the lot of your inheritance uh, now the, the, the fourth point exegetical point uh, is that with the current trend today of the onslaught of Christian persecution that parallels the intensification of anti-Semitism and the growing trend of depopularizing Christianity, especially in this season of the return 
of the demonic spirit of Sodom and Gomorrah. Even if we as believers become an unpopular or a hated minority, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob will still fight our battle. He will keep us covered under his mighty wings. In the natural we may appear as a minority. But with God we are the majority. Because of the angels that are assigned to us. And because of the awesomeness. Because of the marvelous nature of God. Uh, Psalm 105 verses 12 to 15. When they were but a few men in number. Yea, very few and strangers in it. When they went from one nation to another, from one kingdom to another people, he suffered no man to do them wrong. You see, even if you are be belong to God, if you belong to God and you are being punished because of your own actions, God will punish the punisher. <laughs> <laughs> he suffered no man to do them wrong. Yea, he reproved kings for their sakes, saying, Touch not mine anointed, and do my prophets no harm. Uh, another powerful point about the awesome dimension of this marvelous light that we have been called into. We learn from King Uzziah, whose name means Yah is my strength. <laughs> king Uzziah was one of the kings of Judah, who, who many called a good king, started out that way, who came to power when he was just 16 years old. Now, King Uzziah, whose name means Yah is my strength, was prospered by God because he knew where his strength came from. And that prosperity was passed on through his rule to the Israeli nation. That's why we have to make sure that we put God-fearing people in office. Yes. Now, biblical antiquity shows us that he was an intelligent and an innovative king that did not compromise his standards. Uh, because the God that made him strong kept his nation strong. He was not a compromiser and he was not an ignorant trash talker that needed to bamboozle the people that followed him. Second Chronicles 26 and verse 5. And he, King Uzziah, sought God in the days of Zechariah who had understanding in the visions of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. He was an intelligent and an innovative king who's given wisdom and creativity enabled him to defeat the Philistines and the Arabs, and the Arabs, Second Chronicles, chapter 26, verses 6 to 8. And he went forth and warred against the Philistines and break down the wall of Gath and the wall of Jabna and the wall of Ashdod and built cities about Ashdod and among the Philistines. And God helped him against the Philistines. You reading the stuff with me? Yeah. And against the Arabians, the Arabs, that dwelt in Gerbal, and the Mehunims, and the Amorites gave gifts to Uzziah, and his name spread abroad even to the entering in of Egypt, for he strengthened himself exceedingly. But the fame and fortune 
of his reign and of his blessing from God. Unfortunately, it went to his head during his reign. And his pride. Look out for leaders with pride. Yeah. Braggarts. Yeah. They brag about their money and all the wonderful things they have. His pride was what caused his downfall. When he entered the temple of God to burn incense on the altar. And burning incense on the altar was something only the priest could do. By attempting to do this himself, Uzziah was making a statement that he was above submitting himself to the law of God and thus was cursed by God. Second Chronicles chapter 26, verses 16 to 19. I need a final reader for the morning. Second Chronicles chapter 26, verses 16 to 19. Who's going to volunteer? Thank you, Donnett. But after Uzziah became powerful, his pride led to his downfall. He was unfaithful to the Lord his God and entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense <laughs> on the altar of incense. Azariah the priest with 80 or other courageous priests of the Lord followed him in. They confronted King Uzziah and said, It is not right for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord. That is for the priests, the descendants of Aaron, who have been consecrated to burn incense. Leave the sanctuary, for you have been unfaithful, and you will not be honored by the Lord God. Uzziah, who had a censer in his hand ready to burn incense, became angry. While he was raging at the priests in their presence before the incense, altar in the Lord's temple, leprosy broke out on his forearm. Hmm. Hmm. Second Chronicles 26 verse 21 tells us that Uzziah was a leper until the day he died. And he traveled from house to house being a leper because he was cut off from the house of the Lord. My God, he started so good. <laughs> but it went to his head. And then he went to go against the priest yeah. in the house of God. Yeah. You see, you can be riding high one minute. Yes. And then all that stuff goes straight to your head. Yeah. And you can get set to even place yourself and judgment above the word of God. And above the true house of God and his people. I'm talking about the fire breathing Holy Ghost filled, water baptized, true believers. And then all of a sudden, all of the good that you might have done in the past, when you decide that your will is above the will of God's people and that your law and wisdom is above God's incomparable omniscient wisdom and knowledge pride always goes before the fall yeah. King Isaiah was creative in 2nd Chronicles chapter 26 and 15 tells us that, that, that he made in Jerusalem engines invented by cunning men to, to, be, to be on the towers and upon the bulwarks to, to shoot arrows and, and great stones with all. And his name, fame, spread far abroad. Far abroad. Everybody was talking about him. For he was marvelously helped till he was strong. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up for his destruction. Yes, yes, yes. No, no, no. The, the, the quite obvious exegetical point here is uh, the, the, that when we are marvelously helped, uh, we must never forget where our strength comes from. Yes. Our help is in the name of the Lord yes. who has made heaven and earth. Yes. He will not suffer our foot to be moved. Yes. Oh, God helped us in the past. Yes. 
and we can't throw him away. Oh, I, I, I can't help myself. God has been so good to me. We must never forget God. Mm, the quite obvious exegetical point here is that, 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 that when we are, are marvelously helped, we must never forget where our strength comes from. Amen? Amen, amen? But there is also another powerful point that further helps us to understand the marvelous dimension of the light that our present day royal priesthood has been called to and that we learn from Azariah, the chief priest, and all the priests that stood up against the king yeah. to not let him violate the sanctity of the temple yeah. by coming into it to burn incense before the Lord. Yeah. A role that has been preserved for the priest, yeah. the sons of Aaron, that are consecrated to burn incense. We that have been charged as the priest of God in this day, in this age, are never to allow pompous and pride-filled governmental leaders to come into our temples, to come into our churches, to come into our synagogues. No matter how successful they may be, or what they can give to the church or to us individually. We are never to allow our places for God's worship to be used as a place for the manipulative and deceitful burning of false incense. Amen. Amen. Especially by powerful leaders that we know are burning strange incense. Stand up. Stand up for Jesus. I don't care who you are. Stand up for Jesus. Do not let them come and burn strange incense. If you know that person is not surrendered to Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, what in God's name are they doing in the house of God? Stand Firm and know that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, yes. he stands with you. Yes. He is Jehovah Jireh. Yes. I don't care what they plan to give you. God will provide. Yes. I will lift mine eyes to the hills from whence cometh my help. Our help is in the name of the Lord who has made heaven and earth. This little preacher right here, yeah. I'm standing up for God. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. I will not be bought. I will not be manipulated yeah. into bringing a curse on my head yeah. and subsequently a curse on your own. Yes. No strange incense in the house of God. That's the word. Pure incense. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. With thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. No strange incense in God's house. Let my prayer be set forth in thy sight. As the incense. Yes, Lord, Strange incense is a foul scent in the nostrils of God. In Jesus.